staying in place during the disaster. Electronic participation is encouraged and pursuant to the governor's emergency orders, a maximum of 10 people will be allowed to be physically present. If you choose to be physically present, you'll be screened by authorized staff for signs and symptoms of illness. Based on the results of that screening, certain physical attendees may be denied entry. The following members are physically present. We have Ms. Kupka, Mr. Bush, and Mr. Granger in the boardroom. Mr. Stonehill and myself are participating remotely. Please, uh, those, those of us participating through remote, uh, electronic or remote means uh, have notified the chair, including me, that temporary disabilities and or other medical conditions exist that prevents the member's physical attendance. I direct the clerk to include the statement and the statement of, of those remotely participating board members to be memorialized in the minutes. Give me one second, I'm moving on to the agenda. All right, uh, do we have any amendments to the agenda? No, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Young. Now we have public comment. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person in order to afford everyone an opportunity to speak. If comments relate to a specific public hearing item, we ask that you offer those comments at the time of the public hearing. I will once again, if anybody would like to uh, speak, just uh, give me a shout out in the chat box, or if not, I will pause right now and wait to see if anyone would like to make public comment. Please state your name and your address for the record. Thank you. Dr. Young or fellow board members, does anyone have any written correspondence that would like to be read? No, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And now we'll move on to reports from members of the board. Mr. Stonehill. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's been kind of a, a slow week. Um, last couple of weeks, but on uh, Tuesday, the 12th, uh, ended up meeting uh, down on Roseland Road uh, as a result of a couple of um, uh, concerned citizen comments that reached out to me and referenced the uh, parking lot that's going on down on Roseland Road. So I actually went down and ended up meeting with, um, with VDOT and one of the contractors that was doing some taping um, and they went and actually we physically walked off all the uh, the parking lot and um, showed me the area and all the, the, the latest plan that VDOT came up with. And uh, I was able to then uh, speak to the, the concerned citizens and explain to them what was going on and um, everybody was good. So um, their timeline is kind of hurry up and wait um, on that project down there for the parking lot. Um, Thursday the 14th, uh, I, along with all the other group, we met up for the uh, another budget meeting. And then earlier that day, I met up with a committee to speak about formulating the new uh, taxes that the county has um, now the authority to work with um, for 2021. Um, the uh, cigarette tax was the, was the biggest thing, and also um, I spent uh, all day Friday the uh, 15th and then actually yesterday as well talking to people in uh, Richmond, in North Carolina, um, in reference to uh, how they do these things. So that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. Stonehill. Ms. Kupka. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a lengthy report. However, I will not read all of it. I will, as I normally do, provide it to the Freelance Star and Project 94 and post it on my Facebook page tomorrow morning. Uh, just a couple highlights. I too, on May 12th, uh, separately from Mr. Stonehill, visited Wayside Park regarding social media posts uh, with reference to the archeological dig going on there. The area subject to the dig is fenced off and per the construction company, cameras have been installed to monitor the area. Please do not enter this area as it is not safe to do so. And we do not want anyone disturbing the archeological dig and recovery of any artifacts there. 
The park, the riverfront proper, is still open to the public per the current state restrictions of fishing and exercise until the groundbreaking for the bridge occurs in late June or early July. On May 15th, I participated in a telephone conference for elected officials hosted by Congressman Rob Whitman. I asked two questions on the call summarized herein. Is there any update from last week's call regarding resumption of youth sports and summer activities? Angela Navarro, Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth, responded that in a few weeks in phase two, provided downward trends continue, the gathering guidelines, the number will increase from 10 to 50 persons. And we will begin to see the allowance of non-contact youth sporting events, limiting the audience to keep the numbers down below the 50. I also asked if there was any updated guidance from the governor's office regarding the definition of the term gathering, limited to 10 persons, given that we have King George High School graduation ceremonies this week, and a number of staff are required to be present to execute the ceremonies, and the seeming disparity in the allowance for retail stores and churches to operate at 50% capacity, clearly above the 10 person limitation indoors on gatherings. I want to thank Dr. Robert Benson and Sheriff Giles for the conversations we've had about this in the past week. The word from Deputy Secretary Navarro is that the church guidelines were eased specifically due to the constitutional issues and pending litigation involved and the need for businesses to reopen their doors. I did have a number of parents of King George High School graduates contact me about this in the past week, and I'm truly sorry I don't have a better answer for you. I thank all of you graduates and their parents for their patience this week, and I hope that later this summer, if conditions allow, you can have a more celebratory event in honor of this milestone. Milestone. I want to thank King George High School and the school board and Dr. Benson for doing what you can. I did see photos online of the celebrations today, and given the circumstances, it looked like most folk, folks seemed pleased with the results, so thank you for that. Uh, May 15th, later that day, uh, Ms. Binder and I participated in a telephone call with Secretary Matthew Strickler, the Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia, regarding reopening of public beaches. He is surveying all jurisdictions with waterfront access in the Commonwealth on behalf of the governor to determine a beach opening way forward. We stress to the secretary that our public beach, beaches lack many of the high touch services common to many tourist destinations, boardwalks, handrails, public bathrooms, et cetera, and urge consideration by the governor for reopening our waterfront areas for more than fishing and exercise, subject to the social distancing guidelines as the fresh air and environment might benefit our citizens who have been homebound for so long. Today, I had a telephone conversation with Joseph Baidu, Administrator of Heritage Hall. The facility currently has adequate PPE, and he wishes to thank the public for the outpouring of support they've received in the last couple weeks. To our first responders, healthcare workers, grocery and pharmacy workers, thank you once again for putting yourselves in harm's way to make sure our basic needs continue to be met. To our community, please keep doing what you're doing to care for yourselves and your families and get fresh air and exercise following social distancing guidelines to stay healthy. Per the governor's order, effective May 15th, we are at a turning point. We are in phase one. Despite that, there are some in our community who aren't ready to be there. Please respect their wishes to carry about their business as they see fit. Let's try to show, let's try to all show each other the kindness as we have been, and most of all, a little bit of grace so we can meet in the middle and be the caring community I know King George to be. As long as benchmark, benchmarks continue to be met, I plan to resume uh, in-person Saturday office hours outdoors, weather permitting, at one of our local county parks in mid-June. Thank you again to all of you in our community for the opportunity to serve you. Please don't hesitate to contact me via email with your cares and concerns for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kupka. Mr. Bush. 
On um, the 14th, I participated in a budget work session along with my colleagues. And um, I've had quite a few uh, conversations this week uh, with some constituents, very informative uh, about some things coming up um, that I'll be, I'll have to do a little research on, but I'll probably be uh, bringing to the, to the board um, to talk about in the near future. Besides that, um, I remain available. If anybody would like to contact me, please do so. I'm available via email, phone call, Facebook. Um, that's what I'm here for. So please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Granger. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, I also attended the uh, Thursday, May 14th uh, budget work session. Um, also received an email just uh, before the meeting that I'll share with everyone about the census uh, from Mr. Clark. Uh, we are currently at 66.7% uh, of the households responding in the county. Uh, Mr. Clark says that's 1.2% better than our self-response rate for all 2010. So that's very encouraging. So we have uh, a third of the way to go. And uh, he also mentioned that self-response will now go until October. Uh, which should allow the Census Bureau the time to get enumerators into all the areas to distribute forms to houses without street mailing addresses. So uh, if you haven't had an opportunity, uh, please try to put forth the effort to, to get that done. It is important as well. Uh, other than that, um, I noticed uh, that I have a member on the Landfill Advisory Committee. His term is up. And so I would like to make a motion to reappoint Mr. Jordan Keyford to the Landfill Advisory Committee. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any nay? Chair votes aye. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jordan, for uh, serving us. Mr. Granger? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I, I thank you, Mr. Jordan, as well. Uh, other than that, I, I am done, but uh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I made a, a mistake. It's Jordan Tford. So thank you, Jordan, for serving. Um, I participated in a call with Ms. Kopka from a representative of the governor's office about the status of our parks with water access. We stressed how citizens need access to fresh air, sunshine, and to get out. From what I have seen with two visits to Wayside Park at the shoreline, people are properly social distancing, mostly just fishing, and I even saw a family building a castle out of shells. Uh, with that being said, too, I, I've reached out to uh, Dr. Young and our county attorney to to contact the state of Virginia to find out how we can secure the artifacts that they've been finding there. I've had several conversations before um, what, the COVID pandemic with the people that are doing the archaeology dig there, and they're pretty amazing people. And they they really shared with me all the things they found in the the outline of the plantation home and everything, and and all the artifacts that they had found at the time. But now with all the space opened up a little more, I'm sure it'll be interesting to find out what what the more artifacts they've uh, pulled up from the ground. Um, on May 12th, I held a second virtual town hall from 6 to 7 p.m. I appreciated the opportunity to talk with my constituents and appreciate Sheriff Giles, Dr. Young, Chris Steins, and our registrar, Lori Gump, who gave us an important information on how the COVID-19 impact on elections. I also want to thank all departments that submitted brief summaries. And yesterday, I participated with Ms. Kupka on the GWRC and FAMPO meetings where we discussed transportation needs in the FY 2021 budget and its challenges. And I also want to thank all of the citizens of King George for everything they're doing from our first responders to our grocery store workers to everyone making masks and delivering meals to those people on the front lines. Thank you very much. And I am always open like Mr. Bush for a phone call or an email or check me out on Twitter. I'm not very good at it, but I'm working on it. And uh, I appreciate all you do. Thank you. And that is the end of my report. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Moved. A second? Second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Chair votes aye. Motion carries. All right, Mr. Britton, do we have a report for the cap? No, wait a minute. Constitutional Office report? Dr. Young, do we have any? No constitutional officers, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Britton, report of the county attorney, personal property tax exemption for the disabled. 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I have two things. Um, the personal property tax exemption is for uh, vehicles, actually, which are outfitted for the transportation of the uh, disabled. I There were comments made at the last um, board meeting, and I believe Ms. Kupka um, had one about um, it, the we amending the ordinance to make sure that it was private vehicles for private use, non-commercial vehicles. I did that, updated it, as well as ensuring that the Commissioner of the Revenue and or the Treasurer could promulgate uh, rules and regulations to ensure that there were um, major um, uh, updates to the vehicles, such as lifts, and not just like a small mirror or a hand. Um, a knob on the wheel or something like that could, that could have easily be removed. The intent of the ordinance is to allow people who make significant upgrades to their vehicles in order to transport the disabled um, to be taxed on the fair market value of the vehicle. So if you were to have a vehicle worth $40,000 a van and you might put $40,000 into it, which actually drives the resale value down um, to next to nothing unless someone else for some reason uh, would need a disabled equipped van. Um, so what we do, we don't have the ability to waive it, so we model the ordinance uh, based on the volunteer fire and rescue vehicle waiver and brought the um, tax rate down to a point where no bill would be generated. I ran those amendments by the Commissioner of the Revenue, the Treasurer, the County Administrator, no comments were received, and um, so if uh, the board were of a mind to do it, we could advertise that um, for public hearing at your pleasure. What are the uh, feelings of uh, fellow board members? Ms. Kupka? Uh, I didn't have any edits or amendments to it, and I just wanted to thank Mr. Britton for incorporating my suggestion. I think it's a good idea, and we should move forward with the public hearing for it. Thank you. Mr. Bush? Thank you, Mr. Britton, for uh, putting this together. I'm ready to move forward. Mr. Granger? I agree. We should move forward with the, the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Stonehill. Uh, thanks to everybody, and yes, let's move forward. I agree. I also want to thank everybody. Uh, you never can say thank you enough. Thank you for all the work everybody did on this. Uh, Mr. Britton? Madam uh, Chair. Mr. Uh, go ahead, I'm, Dr. Young. I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, but you, you're going to have to take a vote versus a consensus um, because you'd be voting to advertise for a public hearing. So it's okay. a public vote. All right. Um, do I have a motion? Uh -huh. Second. So Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Any nays? Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. One other matter I just wanted to raise. Um, at the last public hearing, we discussed the um, appointments to the towing board, and uh, that email had gone out to you and Dr. Young, and I emailed a comprehensive report and the recommendations of the sheriff uh, for the reappointment. Uh, Sergeant Weston and Sheriff Giles uh, did a lot of work uh, in order to call everybody to update the tow board appointments, and those appointments can be made they are made by the Board of Supervisors, but they would be required for the tow board to um, hold its hearing. There are several matters updating the tow board ordinance that we have, we would like to bring before the tow board. The ordinance currently requires that the tow board review and rec recommend um, so to the Board of Supervisors before any amendments are made to the tow board ordinance. This is for police towing of vehicles where the um, law enforcement, we don't have police, but where the uh, state police or uh, sheriff's office uh, would be calling for a tow as a result of law enforcement. Uh, we currently have eight people on the tow cycle and they go in order and there are some amendments that need to be made to the tow board makeup as a result of people um, cycling off, no longer being eligible, retirement, and what have you. I sent a list out of all of the people that are recommended by the Sheriff's Office um, and the reasons for that. 
if the appointments were to be made, then the tow board could hold its meeting and um, the amendments could be made whatever amendments they want plus the recommended sheriff's amendments that goes with advice but not consent of the tow board meaning that the board of supervisors has the sole say uh, in the ultimate um, amendment to the ordinance if any uh, what we are looking for is amongst other things to appoint the new tow board and to look for level billing so that each and every tow and service provided by a police requested tow or law enforcement requested tower is at the same rate so at the pleasure of the board, whenever um, you would like to do it, um, if you could appoint those members so that Sheriff Giles could get the tow board uh, going, uh, Sergeant Weston is the uh, point of contact at the Sheriff's office. And he has our proposed amendments. I've already drafted the proposed amendments for review and consideration by the tow board. And Mr. Granger. Yeah. Mr. Granger, can you talk into the microphone, please? I apologize, I had muted it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Britton, I have received your email and I'm amenable with moving forward with making the motions to appoint these members to the board. Uh, my question would be, if we're to move forward making the appointments, do we need to make, make them one at a time or can we make one appointment for all five members to be appointed? You, uh, and you can do it either way. Um, these appointments are not by locality or jurisdictions as some uh, committee and board members are. These are appointments that can be made at one time by any or all members separately or together. And in fact, uh, there are requirements of the types of members and their expertise, for instance, a tow or law enforcement, retired law enforcement, what have you. That's why we uh, took the extra effort to make the recommendations. I think it would have been very difficult had the sheriff's office not done the legwork and groundwork uh, in order to find people. And all of the people have agreed to serve if the board were to appoint them, but they can all be made together. Understood, and, and thank you to the sheriff's office as well for doing that legwork to help us find these uh, individuals and for their, their willingness to serve. Um, if everyone's okay, then I'll go and make a motion. I'd like to move to appoint Kevin Bobkin and Sergeant Weston as law enforcement representatives, Gil Kennedy uh, as a citizen representative, Morgan Zwicker and Jerry McDaniel as uh, towing services representatives to the tow board. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. aye. Any nays? Chair votes aye. We have our thank you for everyone who's willing to serve on that board. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll get those appointments um, in a resolution over to uh, Sergeant Weston, and so he can get the tow board impaneled and hold their meeting for, uh, for this year and make any recommendations. And once they've made those recommendations on the ordinance, if any, uh, we'll bring those before the board. Uh, with an outline of what the tow ordinance currently looks like versus what the amendments are that is recommended, if any, by the tow board. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Is that all for your report? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Uh, Dr. Young, do we have any 510 and 511, any board commission agency reports or presentation and reports? No, Madam Chair. I'll move on to our action items. Department of Finance, King George Middle School Change Order. Is that Ms. Cobb presenting? Yes, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. All right, good evening, Madam Chair and the board, um, board members. So tonight I'm bringing a change order to you all for the middle school expansion project in the amount of $51,625. This change order as stated in your board report is for asbestos abatement. Um, the start of demolition work in areas B, C, and D uncovered previ previously unknown asbestos in an older layer of floor tile, the mastic on the HVAC duct insulation, and the joint insulating materials of the water supply lines. The price includes abatement of these materials as outlined in the supporting documentation with no time extension required. This change order is recommended by the county engineer and RRMM architects. So therefore, I recommend that the Board of Supervisors authorize the County Administrator to issue a change order to Branch and Associates 
to increase the contract price of the King George Middle School expansion project by $51,625. Funds are available in the project construction contingency fund. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. I do understand there's a representative here, Mr. Vogel, from the uh, grant from the company doing the construction. Does anybody have any questions? Madam Chair, I have a question, but not for Mr. Vogel. My question would be, with this $51,000, what would be the remaining balance of the contingency fund that we, uh, we're gonna have available after this? Do, do we have uh, those numbers? Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Bush. Um, Adam Vogel is um, our senior architect that works for RRMM architecture firm, which is um, hired by King George County. Um, to partner in the management of the project. Um, um, and after reviewing the numbers, we had $75,000 left of contingency. So with the approval of the change order, they're bringing it down slightly below $25,000 $25, left in the contingency. Ms. Kupka, did you have a question? No, ma'am, thank you for asking that, Mr. Bush. Mr. Granger, did you have a question? No, ma'am. Mr. Stonehill? No, not at this time. Madam Chair, I do have a question uh, that I think that Adam can um, clarify. Um, I had a discussion with Adam regarding this change order. Um, I was pretty surprised that this change order was coming down the pipeline. And after conversations with him, he had advised me that at the previous board meeting that he attended, he um, was not afforded an opportunity to um, talk to the board regarding the change order. And um, he had intended to discuss with you all an expectation for there to be subsequent change orders for asbestos removal. Um, I was not aware of that, and I found that a surprising conversation. And I think that there'd be value added to um, ask him to elaborate that, elaborate on that a little bit. So the board has full understanding of what's going on at the work site. Thank you. I would also like to hear that, Mr. Vogel, because as you know, I've been very vocal about not understanding why the asbestos was not identified when the project was taken over since the building was built in 1968 and there was already asbestos, especially in the Votech building. So Mr. Vogel, I'd like to hear that. Absolutely. Um, whose question should I start with first, Dr. Young's or uh, Mrs. Binders? You could go with either one first. Okay. And Dr. Young asked about uh, the potential for future change orders for asbestos and, and the process of having multiple change orders for asbestos uh, at this point. Um, the project now is, com is completing the additions to the building and is moving on to the renovations of the existing portions of the building, uh, the original phasing of the project. That is moving from one portion of the building to another. And as we are doing so, we are subsequently uncovering additional areas that require abatement. And so it's once these areas are uncovered, then we're able to quantify the amount of abatement needed. And that's when we are able to submit the pricing. Um, but it's due to the nature of the phasing of the project is why we're having multiple asbestos change orders. Um, to Ms. Binder's question, um, the uh, initial bid uh, was based on the documentation that we were given. Um, the initial construction documents from when the building was built and the subsequent asbestos testing reports, the yeah, here are reports uh, performed by the school every three years, uh, neither of which uh, had any abatement uh, noted in them besides the auditorium floor, which we were not uh, changing the flooring. So we knew we wouldn't be uh, getting into any abatement work there. So we did have an allowance amount in the project for $25,000, but obviously that was not nearly uh, enough for these unforeseen conditions. Mr. Vogel, do you, do you see any more potentially? We are assuming there is going to be a little bit more. Um, the previous change order for asbestos, I believe, was in the range of 
$80,000, and that was for area A, which was the uh, portion of the building with the existing kitchen. So there was a lot of plumbing and HVAC duct work around there that had asbestos containing materials. Um, this change order is for areas B and portions of C and D, <clears throat> and they have much less piping. So there is <clears throat> less abatement for these areas, but there are still portions of the ductwork that has not been uncovered yet um, in the ceiling because the ceiling has not been demolished yet. So we do anticipate uh, <clears throat> a subsequent change order for the above ceiling work in area C in small portions of D. And now when you refer to portions, are you talking about the old science rooms and like art room and then maybe the cafeteria portion of the cafeteria? Um, area C and D for this, uh, this project are, uh, D is near the auditorium and the band and in chorus rooms. I know you're familiar with the, with the layout of the building. Um, and then the front port, the old front portion of the building to the left of the old main entrance um, is, the, is area C um, that contains the art room and um, most, most of the classrooms in there. The science rooms are the ones that are in area or covered in this portion of the work. Okay, and also the cafeteria, well, I guess the seating area of the former cafeteria was in this portion or? No, that was in the previous one, that was the area A. Okay. All right, well, thank you for clarifying that. I have a couple more questions, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Dr. Number, Young. Number one, Adam, I think that it'd be um, especially valuable if you could explain to the board, percentage-wise, where we're at with the completion of this project and um, um, the timeline, expected line, timeline for the completion of this project. Are we at 80%, 85%, where we're we at with the completion of the project? Absolutely, yeah, you're right there. We are 80, about 82% uh, based on this last payment application um, and our anticipated uh, completion date as of the progress this morning, progress meeting this morning uh, is uh, the middle uh, two weeks ahead of their, uh, of their con contracted schedule. So, so then, we're finding out now that there's an anticipation for another change order to come down the pipeline regarding the businesses. And um, as stated, we have approximately $24,000 left in contingency. Um, based off of your uh, expertise, do you believe that this change order will be able to come in under the remaining $24,000 that's left in the contingency, or do you think it's going to exceed that? I do believe it'll come in under the, the $24,000. Uh, we did some initial in investigation. We're assuming from this point on that the items that have tested positive for asbestos in the past are gonna test a positive again. Um, and stuck my head up in the ceiling to, to get, an idea, uh, get some rough idea how much to anticipate going forward. And it should be a much smaller change order coming down the line than we've seen previously or in this one. And, and um, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And now, Madam Chair, I just thought that it'd be enlightening for Adam to speak on that because there was a conversation had between Adam, the county staff, and myself, and we explained that it's our thoughts, at least, that the board did not have any appetite for basically um, augmenting this $21 million bond with general fund money. So we made it adamant, adamantly clear that this project has to come in within budget and um, we're hoping that any of these expected change orders coming down the pipeline is going to be able to fit in the contingency. Yes, I thank you for that, Dr. Dr. Young, but I see Mr. Bush has his hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. So um, thank you, Dr. Young, for bringing that up. Um, I'm not going to go over everything in the past. The past is the past, but it is troubling that we have $25,000 left in contingency and we already know another one's coming up. Now, um, Mr. Vogel said that he believes that we have enough money to be able to handle that. Um, but this uh, estimate we just got, we were, we were just told came in higher than what was anticipated. So we may run into a situation where the abatement that is coming down the pipe um, 
may come in higher and exceed that. And that is just if there are no other unforeseen events, which is what a contingency fund is for. If something else is encountered, um, we have no more, no more money to throw at this. And, and Dr. Young's right. I can only speak for myself. I have zero appetite to throw any more money towards this bond, um, given how um, I think we overextended ourselves a little bit with this contingency fund in the beginning. So um, it's just something that I appreciate Dr. Young and his staff keeping their eye on, but uh, it's just something to be aware of. I, I believe in being realistic. I think we're gonna find ourselves falling short um, with funding available in contingency because of unforeseen things, estimates coming in higher than what are anticipated. That, that's my point of view. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bursu. Any of my colleagues have any other uh, questions or discussion items? Okay, um, I thank you, Mr. Vogel, for uh, coming and talking because I know I've given you a hard time in the past. But Dr. Young, I just want to express again, this is another reason that I'm adamant about any future renovation projects of any of our buildings that we need to have an environmental engineer come in and assess properties for asbestos and any other environmental concerns that, that have a high ticket price. It's really imperative that we should have done this with this project. And um, do you have anything else, Dr. Young, on this matter? Um, no, ma'am, other than I believe that the engineer assessment was done and he has, Mr. Vogel has stated that the study didn't reveal the asbestos that was in the um, flooring, except for in the gym area. That's fine. I, just, I knew about more asbestos, but I'm not going to keep uh, hitting that can down the road. But uh, I mean, just I'm very adamant about environmental engineers coming and looking at that. But that is my opinion. Um, but I do once again want to thank Mr. Vogel for coming and, and explaining it more to us. Thank you very much. With that, I will I will move on. Here. Go ahead. I was just going to say you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Uh, move on to our discussion item: restoring public hearings to the Board of Supervisor uh, agenda. Uh, before we move on, I, I would like to make a motion to authorize the County Administrator to issue a oh, branch and associates to increase the contract price of King George Middle School expansion project by $51,625. Second. Any discussion? My discussion is, thank you, Mr. Granger, for catching me on that one. Um, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any nay? Chair votes aye, motion carried. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Young? Restoring public hearings to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, this was the discussion item that was requested to be added to the agenda at the request of uh, the Chairman. Um, Madam Chair, so I'm going to defer to you um, um, regarding your thoughts on pursuing or restoring the public hearing to the BOS agenda. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Young. I just wanted to have a discussion with my colleagues. I know I had asked Mr. Britton to reach out to all of you, with, and he reached out to community development first to find out a list of the public hearings that were slated on the agenda for us to hear ones that were slated to come before us before we stop the public hearing and those that have come after some of them concern ordinances that we wanted to uh, fix sort of the sign ordinance being one of them and other ones are businesses that would like to open up in the community and the villages project so what is the feeling of my colleagues on this? And uh, one thing I did act, ask uh, Dr. Young to, is to reach out to um, our superintendent of the schools, Dr. Benson, about possibly using the football stadium or the auditorium or the gym to, proper, to practice proper social distancing and having a venue, a large venue for public hearing. So, uh, any of my colleagues, what are your feelings on this? And I'll start with Ms. Kupka first. Uh, I absolutely think we should look to move forward with resuming public hearings. Uh, we're, we're about to speak later during Dr. Young's county administrator report about reopening our buildings. Uh, so as long as we have a plan in place to do that and we do what we can to adhere to the social distancing guidelines, which hopefully is going to be in a couple weeks, 50, and then we'll move on from there. Um, yeah, I think we need to move forward and get back to business. 
Thank you. Mr. Bush. I'm all for moving forward with uh, getting back to normal operations as soon as possible. Thank you. Mr. Granger. Uh, I agree with my colleagues. I think we should try to move forward with uh, starting these up. Um, probably not the first we, uh, meeting in June, but if we could start in the second meeting in June, that would probably be, in my opinion, advantageous. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stonehill. I say let's get back to at least what normal will look like here in the near future. So I'm good to go on uh, anything y'all want to do. Well, thank you, board. Uh, Dr. Young, could you have a, a possible uh, plan talking with your staff and maybe Dr. Benson for our next meeting? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. Well, then we will look forward to it at our next June 2nd meeting. Thank you so much for the input of my colleagues and Dr. Young, you and your staff for the plan that you will come up with. Next up will be the county administrator's report. Dr. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, there's a, two items that's not captured in the board packet because uh, we were just notified recently before the board packet was published. Um, I have good news for the board. Um, we were notified by the Secretary of Finance for the Commonwealth um, and advised that King George County will receive $2.3 million from the CARES Act. Um, the staff is currently taking a look at um, the 20 page document describing the requirements and compliance um, uh, measures that must be met for the spending of the um, monies. Um, in addition, it's currently under legal review um, by the county attorney. However, it is our intent to uh, bring before the board a very comprehensive and detailed briefing describing the CARES Act uh, at the next meeting in June, and we will continue to work on a plan as a recommendation to come before the board uh, for approval before um, um, releasing that money into um, expenditures. Second, we received a, approval for $31,550 CDBG grant from the DHCD. Um, if you all will recall, the board authorized us to execute a memorandum of agreement with Northern Neck Electric Dominion Power and our Northern Neck uh, communities for the express use of trying to utilize um, the right of way for utility companies to leverage uh, the laying of fiber and expanding our uh, fiber network in King George County and addressing the last mile internet access. Um, the first step of, of that plan, if you all recall, was actually pursuing this grant um, by all of the localities that are members of the agreement and all of the localities were approved the $31,550 grant um, for the planning grant for the initiative. These monies will be dedicated to working out the design of uh, the fiber network and um, we're really looking forward to the discussion. The next step is establishing two different committees. First, there'll be a local committee in King George County that will be comprised of st stakeholders in the community um, that'll continue to weigh in on the plans that are being produced for uh, the broadband grants. Um, and we'll be bang banging a recommendation to the board for approval at the next board meeting. In addition, they have what is called a management team that's maintained at the PDC. As you all are aware, our PDC is the George Washington Regional Commission. However, since the majority of the members of this memorandum of agreement are members of the Northern Neck uh, Planning District Commission, the Northern Neck Planning District Commission will actually chair this management committee. The management committee will uh, be comprised of the Northern Neck PDC director, uh, members from our power utilities, um, and um, the county administrators from um, the regional group. So um, again, we'll, we'll begin putting together the plans for the committee and the management group. And as we start um, initial start the meetings off um, regarding the management of this uh, design and planning for the initiative, um, make sure that I bring notes back to, uh, to the board so everybody's aware of um, the support initiative that's taking place in King George County. Um, with that being said, um, we do have a plan regarding the reopening of our public facilities. Um, I attached the memorandum um, detailing that plan that we intend to push out to the county staff tomorrow. However, I also have a presentation um, that I would like to present to the board and to the general public that summarizes that plan for the way forward for King George County administration. Thank you, Dr. Young. I know I have some questions afterwards, and I'm sure my colleagues will too. Go right ahead. Roger, Chris, if I pull up the slides. Cool. 
Next slide. Again, this plan is designed to provide guidance to the county staff in order to prepare for a reopening of public facilities in accordance with federal and state guidelines. Next slide. If you recall, we had executive order number 55 from the governor's office that was published on 20 March 20. And in response to that executive order, the county took the following actions, which included escalating our public safety operations and essential services, closing down the government buildings to the general public, using alternate means to deliver government service to customers. When I say alternate means, alternate means, that means the promotion of paying tax bills and paying fees uh, via either mailbox or online. And as you all are aware, the Community Development Department actually had a curbside picked up a plan to conduct the plan reviews absent of the um, applicant to ensure that they can continue um, the land use uh, process. In addition, we had ceased all public meetings of commissions, authorities, and committees in King George County. Uh, since the publishing of that order, um, the governor has now su superseded it with ex executive order number 61, which was published on 8 May 2020. I would like to note that executive order number 61 was born out of the governor's plan for reopening the Commonwealth, which is titled Forward Virginia and can be referenced online at the governor's office website. Uh, um, in light of this executive order, um, we are now producing before the board a plan to reduce the emergency operations center's operations, reopen government buildings to the general public, offering limited services to customers in person, and resuming public meetings of all our governing agencies or governing bodies in King George County. Next slide. So here's our approach, which is four phased. We have what we're calling the build phase, which has already began, and uh, we expect to conclude on the 21st of May. We then have the socialization phase, which are three days, 26th to 28th of May. We have a limited opening, which um, will begin to open in the facilities to the general public on the 28th of May, and that will extend through phase one of the Fort, Fort Virginia plan. Once Fort Virginia plan comes uh, moves into phase two and we'll get more gu guidance from the Commonwealth, we'll then take a look at putting together a plan for phase four, which is a full opening of government, government facilities. Next slide. So just a brief summary of phase one um, build. Um, as we speak, the General Properties Department is uh, surveying and installing physical barriers at what we call high touch point areas. High touch point areas are defined as areas within our county facilities where uh, uh, the King George County citizen, the King George County employee uh, interacts. Um, some of those areas that have been identified includes in the treasurer's office, Commissioner Revenue's office, registrar's office, the admin department, finance department, Smoot Library, Courthouse, and Department of Social Services. If you walk through some of our facilities now, you'll see that we are taking an expedient approach to um, building these um, barriers. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were transparent and not obtrusive. So we're, if you go to some of these facilities um, as we speak, you see something similar to what we have in the sheets. If you go into sheets on uh, Route 3, you'll see that they have actually plexiglass that's hanging from steel cable, and it serves as a sneeze guard uh, to prevent the transmission of um, spittle or, uh, or uh, casual uh, contact. Um, so we decided that that was a very quick and expedient method to install in the public facilities, and we basically uh, replicated that in our facilities and we'll be replicating um, that temporary fix in these high touch point areas. While these um, barriers are being installed, I've been in close contact with our develop I mean, with our directors, and they are currently working on staffing plans with uh, following guidance from the county administration. Um, teleworking will remain an available option for our employees, but their staffing plans will include um, um, plans to have employees that can always uh, meet our customers in person during business hours. Next slide. So that then brings us into phase two, which is socialization. Um, during this phase, county employees will be brought back to work on May 26, 2020 at 8 a.m. However, the public facilities will remain closed to the general public. This is because this phase will allow for the departments to retrofit their processes, begin servicing customers both in person and remotely. This phase will also afford the staff the opportunity to rearrange department furniture and equipment and procure, procure the supplies that they need to meet state and federal health guidelines. So during this period, you'll note that we also will have what we're calling an employee stand down. During the stand down, which will be one hour uh, 
from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock on the uh, 26th of May, where the, our employees, 100% King George County employees, will attend a virtual uh, uh, conference with the Emergency Operations Center and the senior leadership from King George County. During that time, we will discuss the best practices for combating COVID-19, keep themselves safe, and uh, make recommendations for them to um, uh, take to ensure that they maintain a healthy work environment and can protect their personal safety. In addition, um, uh, we will be handing out thermometers to our directors at that time. And the reason for the thermometers is we felt that it's important that we do temperature checks. But these temperature checks will not be performed on uh, the general public. Rather, if we have the physical barriers in place, we feel that the real threat uh, for uh, COVID-19 spread lies amongst the county employees if they work in such close proximity with each other in county departments. So each county employee uh, will be uh, checked for their temperature prior to beginning the workday. The responsibility for uh, performing that check on um, the employees is individual director. After those employees are checked, or um, if not by the director, but a third person, a third party, confirmation will be sent to the administration office that uh, temperature checks are complete and the employee uh, workforce is safe. Um, in addition to the employee stand down and the socialization period, we will have additional policies in place. For example, we're going to restrict the use of common areas. When I say common areas, I mean an example, the employee kitchen. The employee kitchen will still be allowed for food storage, but we're not going to have uh, employees gathering around the tables in, in there and uh, um, not practicing social distancing. Um, we already have a policy uh, where we have limited interdepartmental travel. Um, I've asked our employees and our departments if, if they need to conduct business between departments, let's handle it via telephone or via go to meeting if possible and present face to face uh, interaction. Uh, we're still going to maintain that policy to prevent the spread of any potential um, uh, disease. Uh, in addition, uh, employee gatherings, and when I say gatherings, like retirements or uh, birthday parties or celebrations that were commonly held in the boardroom for county employees will be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. And if approved, um, we will not be um, doing our traditional um, buffet-style um, meals where um, there are multiple, multiple uh, touches of food and um, potential spread of uh, the disease. Next slide. Um, that then brings us into phase three, which is limited opening. Again, this is the day uh, 28 May 20 um, that we will intend to open the facilities to the general public. Um, before that date, we will make sure that we have a strong communication plan in place that's put out to not only our staff, but to the general public as well. The purpose of the communication plan would be to inform the general public of the restoration of in-person services in the county facilities, but we'll also we still be promoting alternative services as the preferred method for delivering government services to the general public. Um, in addition, we'll be um, preparing the facilities um, for the reception of the, our citizens. We'll be placing social distancing markers on the floors in front of um, department uh, queuing areas, no different than what you would see in the grocery stores. Um, we'll have hand sanitizer placed at the ent entrances, the exits of facilities, and the county officers will continue to close at 3.30 p.m. so we can allow, afford our employees that one hour a day to ensure that they can um, be sanitized uh, their respective uh, workplaces and their um, uh, uh, common areas. We do uh, still have the escalated cleanings that uh, taking place with the general properties department, but um, being frank, the general properties can't clean keyboards, they can't clean light switches and you know some of those uh, touch point areas where people are working. So it's up to the individual employee to sanitize the area and make sure that they have a healthy work environment. Um, we we'll also will have uh, limited access points uh, in public facilities. Access will be restricted to one entrance and um, not one exit, but multiple exits to each facility. For example, in, um, in the Rivercom building, we'll have the area in front of the elevators at the limited entrance into the uh, facility. We will have an uh, employer there can, that can direct people to um, Commissioner Revenue's office or the Treasurer's office. They can also monitor if those offices uh, maintain more than two or three people in, the, um, in those offices and they can't sustain the social distancing. And if that's the case, they can queue the citizens outside of the office offices and ensure that we don't exceed capacity and we can keep both our citizens and our employees safe. Um, um, and uh, the other 
uh, rationale behind the limited one entrance to prevent um, the passing of people that are coming into the building, the people that are exiting the building, and therefore not able to social distance. We'll allow people to go into the, entr the single entrance, then encourage people leaving the building to utilize a separate exit so we can pr uh, prevent that potential contamination. Next slide. Um, regarding um, um, that's that's for the county staff, and my recommendation would be for the board of supervisors meetings to continue to be held remotely and uh, maintain the board's policy for public meetings and public comments um, regarding um, um, public meetings. Um, that includes limiting um, citizens in the boardroom during public meetings to or li limiting all individuals in boardrooms to 10 people or less until that does change or it is raised to 50, then we can start to ease um, those limitations. Um, well, I would also recommend that other governing bodies, uh, specifically, or for example, the Planning Commission, the Economic Development Authority, um, uh, the Recreation and Advisory Committee, ask all these uh, committees to resume their public meetings. However, their public meetings will replicate those of the Board of Supervisors where we will afford them an opportunity to, to conduct their meetings via remote access, or they'd have the opportunity to uh, adopt the all virtual meeting policy similar to what uh, Board of Supervisors has. Um, in closing, we then have the emergency guidance that's being put out to our staff uh, for if employees test positive for COVID-19 or family members test positive for COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, um, we have had um, to test the system once specifically with uh, a family member testing, uh, testing positive for COVID-19 or uh, symptoms similar to the disease, and we know that the system works. So we have captured it in black and white, and we will continue to um, affect that system to make sure that we can keep our employees safe and keep um, uh, board of supervisors informed. Next slide. Again, that's the details regarding phase one of the four of Virginia plan. Um, we will come back to the board with a phase four full opening once we get a good understanding of guidance from the four of Virginia plan phase two. Madam Chair, that's the my presentation. Let me go around the horn, and uh, I know everyone's got some questions. Uh, Ms. Kupka. I don't have any questions for you. I just want to say thank you very much, Dr. Young, for your hard work on this. Uh, and I'm assuming, because you and I have had this discussion via email, that all of these expenses that we incur to retrofit our buildings and the things we purchase all can be uh, reimbursed by CARES Act funding, right? Yes, ma'am. We have two funding streams to uh, improvements. Number one, we do have the CARES Act, which we are, uh, again, putting together plans to uh, help cover these expenses. But we also have set a formal line item within the AS400 that's um, dedicated to capturing the costs that we want to lobby against FEMA for reimbursement as well. So we're working to ensure that the county suffers no loss as a result of the pandemic as much as we can. Perfect, thank you very much for that. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kupkin. Mr. Bush. Yes, ma'am, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I saw three things in the protocols um, that I just had questions about. Um, so the first would be the directors being responsible for taking temperatures of their employees. Um, I would just like to note that people still get fever um, if someone has a higher temperature, is that going to trigger um, some kind of response or shutdown of, of a department or something if someone has the fever and then we have to wait for them to go get a test and then see if they test positive or whatever? You know, because in reality, people still get sick. You know, not everything's COVID. Um, someone could have a fever. The, in the morning, the director takes their temperature. Hey, I got somebody with a fever. What happens at that point? Can you elaborate on that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our ceiling is 100.0 Fahrenheit. If someone tests 100.0 Fahrenheit, all call calls is uh, made to human resources, which works the operations center and the county administrator. Um, We've already made that decision that our first flag is um, that employee goes home. And the employee goes home on sick leave, but under the sick leave, that's important. Uh, 
um, by the FFCRA uh, for the Coronavirus Act. Um, Dr. Young, you're, um, Dr. Young, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but your uh, microphone is echoing online. Okay, so that means somebody's mic is on. Yeah, okay, can I you hear me, Madam Chair? You're you're good now. Thank you. Okay, so if someone tests. 100.0 Fahrenheit, then a phone call is made to the Human Resources Department, who is going to put them on leave under the FFCRA, um, uh, uh, and they're going to basically be quarantined by the county. Um, and then the um, Emergency Operations Center will be um, tasked with making daily phone calls, monitoring the symptoms of that employee. And if that employee um, uh, is uh, asked to go get tested, um, we then wait and we, um, we don't make any decisions until the test results come back. So no, the departments aren't shut down. Um, nothing happens until, you know, we have some type of positive confirmation. But if it's simply a fever, employees sent home and they are afforded the opportunity to take sick leave until they recover. And then um, my second question would be, I see we're, we're closing offices at 3.30 to allow for an hour of deep cleaning. So if the employees are responsible for cleaning their keyboard and their cubicles, their immediate area, um, I'm of the opinion that wouldn't really need to take an hour. Um, and I'm only saying that only because I would like to see the protocols you put in place, I think are appropriate, but I would like to see access to those services with those protocols for as long as possible. So let's say till four. So would 30 minutes be more appropriate because you still have after hours cleaning that takes place in the building besides the personal deep cleaning of their workspace. So if you still allotted 30 minutes of deep cleaning for a workspace and you still had the after hours uh, cleaning services, I, I would think that would be sufficient and give, give citizens you know, till four o'clock to get in the building. Some people don't get off till three, three thirty, five, even. You know, and if you can't, you can't. It's just something that I would like to take into consideration. Um, aside that, from that, you know, the protocols that you put in place. As I've said before, you run the day-to-day -day operations of this building, and I, I think you and your team have done a fantastic job. So, Madam Chair, that that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bush, Mr. Granger. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Young, I just like to say thank you for putting together uh, this plan and uh, finding a way forward. I don't have any questions. Just uh, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stonehill. I don't have any questions. I'm just going to say thank you again, Dr. Young and your staff for, as we say, keeping the ship afloat and heading forward. But I'm excited to uh, get things back up and running and uh, back to, like we said, we don't know what normal is going to be in the future, but as, as normal as we can be and to do it safely. So that's all I have. I, you, I have one. Thank you, Mr. Stonehill. I do have a couple questions. One is, you had mentioned before the 100 degree mark, how long would they be quarantined for? It would be three days, seven days, uh, 14 days, especially if yep. they show those signs. Yes, Madam Chair, they would be um, quarantined until um, their, their temp um, decreases, decreases uh, beneath that marker. And after um, an interview, uh, by the Emergency Operations Center. Again, um, phone calls will be made daily by a member of um, the Emergency Operations Center with that employee, and they make that determination, you know, by uh, uh, their interview questions and uh, monitoring of symptoms, making that determination with the county administrator, um, even though uh, safe to come back to work. Okay, and then the uh, emergency guidance, the employee test positive in the uh, family member, that's what, if they actually have the, get the COVID-19 test, correct? Roger, ma'am, we, we had cases where we have had some employees and family members um, became sick and um, they had advised us that they were displaying COVID-19-like symptoms and we sent them home. Um, and told them, hey, don't come back to work until there's a test result that's um, afforded, afforded you all that you can um, talk to us. And we plan to take those, those same measures here. Um, probably even more stringent um, 
seeing that we're opening to the general public and we're bringing people back into offices, I think that we may even take a more conservative approach where, hey, if a family member is home and they're sick, um, we, we probably would leave um, that in, individual home until we get a good understanding of exactly what's going on um, with their family member. Even if it's the flu, well, let's let's get a good understanding of what's taking place in their households before making that um, before making that call to um, bring them back into work. Um, we're being over cautious. Um, based on the fact that um, um, we're trying to get a good understanding of what this pandemic is going to look like, number one, and then number two, um, again, we're going, we have county employees that work in close, close proximity with each other, and the last thing that we want to do is see uh, a, a quote-unquote outbreak within a public facility. Gotcha, um, Doctor. I, I ask that, too, for the fact that um, you know, with with uh, we're not testing every employee. We're just testing or asking them to get tested if they show symptoms. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, Madam Chair. Do we have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, what you did, Dr. Young, and your staff. I, I knew you work long hours and uh, getting everybody on board so that we have a safe reopening plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did you have anything else, Dr. Young? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, as always, um, this is I always leave time in our, our report to invite the Emergency Operations Center to provide the board an update on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our community. So we'd like to turn it over to um, Chief Moody. Take it away, Chief Moody. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Young. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, I'd like to take a few minutes of your time like we did in your previous meetings to uh, to uh, give you a uh, update on uh, where current things are uh, in regards to the numbers and what we're following on a uh, pretty much a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are um, on this slide, as you know, uh, we are um, uh, if you look at the Virginia map, you can see the darker shades of blue that are uh, started in Northern Virginia outside of the uh, national capital region. Uh, but we're, we're seeing that move a little bit further south. Uh, Stafford County leads our, uh, our region uh, by the highest number of cases at, uh, at uh, they actually broke 501 today. All these numbers are cumulative cases and not necessarily active cases today. Um, Spotsylvania comes in second at, uh, they're, they were showing uh, right at 339 today. Uh, King George, we have a total of 48, uh, 48 cumulative cases since this has uh, began. I do want to highlight that, um, that um, there have been many questions, uh, oftentimes uh, from some of the board members uh, and uh, many times from uh, the EOC staff uh, and, and, um, and working with our uh, partners with the uh, Rappahannock Area Health District and finding out how many active cases we have. And um, uh, I can report today that we have uh, 12 active cases of confirmed COVID in King George. Uh, one of the uh, good things that we're, positive things we're seeing is, uh, is you know, uh, we may have, um, you know, uh, our numbers go up uh, a couple new cases, uh, you know, on a daily basis. However, we're starting to see where that, uh, you know, we have new people come onto the active list, and then we have uh, some of the uh, some of the other patients um, coming off of that list. So uh, we're still hovering around that uh, that uh, 10 to 15 uh, active case mark. Um, which uh, is definitely uh, very valuable to find out how many, you know, true active cases we have uh, in the county. Uh, as you can see, we're, you know, we're not, all, not only just tracking what's going on in, in our region, but we're also tracking what's going on across the uh, Potomac River into Maryland. And um, uh, Charles County, uh, the, these numbers are quite higher than what we're seeing in our region. Uh, Charles County's right under uh, 900 cases, St. Mary's at 338, and uh, PG County, which leads uh, the state of Maryland at 12,240 uh, cases. 
uh, not on your map, but we are also uh, following what's going on uh, to the east of us, uh, our neighbor to the east of Westmoreland County, and they have a cumulative number of 43 cases as well. Um, I will highlight that uh, that um, uh, that just uh, last week, uh, the city of Fredericksburg was uh, pretty much close to our numbers, and uh, they have seen quite a bit of an uptick uh, in, in cases over the past week, and now they're uh, they are just uh, reached over 100 cases themselves. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, dashboard that we send out. We do this uh, uh, Monday through Friday. And, um, and one of the things that I'd like for you to note uh, is uh, under that section there on the uh, right-hand side where you see CAC and under today's date, um, you can see how many cases our EMS, uh, our fire rescue staff uh, responds to, um, is responding to uh, uh, calls in which uh, patients have potential uh, COVID-like symptoms. Uh, this would be uh, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, um, uh, cough, fever, uh, et cetera. Uh, so when, they, when these occur, our staff are in full uh, personal protective equipment. Um, they are uh, in N95 respirators, isolation gowns, uh, medical gloves, etc. cetera. Um, you can see we had five uh, calls uh, yesterday with, uh, with potential patients, uh, none to, uh, on zero on Sunday and then three the day before. Uh, uh, as of today, a total of uh, 64 encounters uh, with patients uh, with potential COVID-like symptoms. Um, uh, you can also see that we are uh, started a new column, uh, and that is uh, right there where you have locality, right there in the middle of that slide, locality, total cases, and then active cases. And you can see the active cases uh, numbers right there at 12, and, at, uh, uh, and then in the parentheses is what the differences were within that 24 hours. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and these are just the, um, the, the what we're also sharing on the uh, COVID-19 uh, hub, which is uh, posted on the county's website. And uh, these are uh, tracking and live numbers. Um, and uh, one of the uh, one of the things that's, that that we really like about this uh, slide is that uh, is the bar graph below, and it kind of shows you, um, you know, where each locality. And we we have uh, put in there a couple of the ones from Maryland that we just talked about. Um, that you know you can see kind of in relation to where where we are in comparison to um, to some of the other other localities. Uh, you can also see the total Virginia, the total the number of uh, deaths. Uh, there's still quite a bit of a difference between the uh, between the deaths uh, of COVID in Maryland versus the deaths of COVID in Virginia, uh, and also the cases uh, within uh, the United States, the death count in the United States, are just past 90,000 today, um, and. Um, and so anyway, we're trying to be as transparent as we can with pushing this information out for the public view. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn the rest of the uh, slides over to uh, Chief Lynn. Uh, good evening, uh, next slide please. Just wanna give you an update on some of the actions that we've taken since uh, last time we briefed the board. Uh, the uh, local declaration was extended uh, to June 15th. Uh, we continue to publish the COVID-19 dashboard and help support that. Our PPE, uh, good news about our PPE, our large order of um, isolation gowns that we ordered part of the Northern Virginia purchase that I talked about before, that is in, and uh, we're going to be taking delivery of those this week. So uh, we're able to uh, maintain what we're using and uh, place orders to, to replenish those supplies, which is really important. Uh, the thermometers, uh, Dr. Young talked about, uh, that's the same model that we're using here, and uh, we were able to secure those through our vendor and uh, had those delivered within a couple of days of placing that order. Uh, we submitted a grant uh, through FEMA for uh, personal protective equipment, and uh, hopefully it was about a, almost $11,000 grant we uh, submitted, 
and hopefully we should hear back soon uh, if that grant was approved and uh, recoup some of our costs. Uh, emergency management division assisted uh, Dr. Young with the plan to reopen the county offices and uh, we provided some input and we're tracking that and also long-term recovery uh, for the county and also maintain operations of fire rescue. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is uh, from the uh, governor's office. This is a Ford Virginia phase one. Uh, the openings in the very graphical format that citizens have seen, but I just wanted to include that uh, here in this presentation that we are in phase one. Uh, most of the state is in phase one. There's parts of the state that are not uh, in phase one yet, but uh, I included this. So if citizens hadn't had a chance to see it, uh, they, they can see it now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is some data that we were able to pull uh, from Virginia Department of Health in the Rappahannock Area Health District. A couple things I wanted to point out uh, was tracking some of the patients, and you can see there on the uh, left of the screen the age distribution of the patients, and uh, basically between uh, patients, uh, confirmed cases between the age of 20 and 49 is our biggest um, age groups that we're seeing, uh, 30 to 39 year olds, 21%. Uh, that followed really closely by the 20 to 29 year olds and the 40 to 49 year olds. The uh, next graph is the actual numbers of cases in Virginia, confirmed cases in Virginia, based, uh, broken down into those actual age ranges. The uh, next graphic uh, shows, uh, go back one please. Okay, the, the graphic uh, to the right there shows uh, the testing and how the testing is breaking down between uh, positive cases. Here in the Rapid Health District, a uh, number of uh, tests run per day and the number of, uh, uh, that's in the dark uh, blue line and the lighter blue line is the actual positive cases uh, out of those tests. It shows you the breakdown and then you've got the, um, the, the line graph showing your uh, seven day average. Next slide, please. Uh, this is also uh, data from the health district, the Rappahannock Health District. Uh, the graph on the left is showing, uh, with the upward uh, blue line, is showing the actual number of positive test cases per day here in the Rappahannock, Rappahannock Area Health District. And you can see that number is going up, but then if you look at the, uh, the next uh, graphic, uh, you see you've got that curve that's coming down. That's the actual number of new hospitalizations uh, per day here in the district. So you can see that, uh, you know, early in April, there was definitely that uh, uh, increase in the number of admissions to the hospital. Uh, but however, you see it's down, definitely going on the, uh, the downward trend there. Next slide, please. I just wanted to put this back up, uh, the way the citizens can get information, uh, the county website, uh, Department of Health's website, our Facebook page, King George Fire, and also our uh, KG Alert system, if citizens can sign up for the text messages. Next slide, please. Actions the public can take. Uh, definitely want people to be aware of all the online scams now uh, about, concerning COVID-19. Uh, ranging from, you know, purchasing, you know, N95 masks to other things where uh, people just want to uh, take advantage of people's fears and just want to make sure citizens, when they're um, looking to buy stuff online, uh, that they spend a lot of time in the research and make sure they're buying it from a, um, a trusted source. Social distancing is still important. Washing hands, covering cough, uh, have a fever, stay home avoid large crowds. The graphic here on the right, this is one of the uh, products the CDC puts out, and uh, we've uploaded several of these products, uh, these graphs that citizens can download, and that's gonna be up on the information hub there at the uh, county website. So citizens that want to, uh, business owners that wanna download some of these materials and put in their business, uh, we've had those things, those uh, products that the CDC has made, and we've, uh, put that one place for citizens to go. Uh, next slide, please. Madam Chair, I'd be uh, remiss if I did, if I did not uh, mention this. Um, this week is EMS week. Uh, it uh, happens uh, this time, this week, every year. 
And uh, certainly uh, people um, in working in the EMS field, uh, working in the healthcare field have been very challenged over, uh, over the past uh, couple months um, uh, with, uh, with this, uh, this pandemic that we are dealing with. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, adds more stress to the job than what's already there. And, um, you know, just want to, uh, you know, to mention that out to keep uh, folks in, in EMS uh, everywhere, not just our county, but in all the communities. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, nurses, uh, nurses week was just, uh, I think, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago. And, um, you know, everybody that's working in healthcare uh, certainly playing a vital role. Uh, and there's so many, so many heroes that are not identified and uh, that's been going on this pandemic, but I uh, did just want to put a big shout out for our industry um, and fire rescue uh, that uh, this week was EMS week. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And that's all we have, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Chief Moody. I'll, I'll go around to the board. I do have one question though, quickly. On the cases uh, upticking in Fredericksburg, could that be also because I, I was up in Fredericksburg last weekend and there seems to be a lot more people out and about. Could that also be part of it since people are coming out more for the uptick? You know, I really, really don't have um, that much information to uh, to say that that's a uh, causative link, you know, uh, or not. Um, so not not really sure. Um, okay. I, I suppose it, it it you know it there's uh, some possibility to that. Uh, we haven't gotten any information uh, from the health district or uh, or the the city on uh, some possible causes, but uh, certainly the next the next uh, uh, you know, week and, and, and weeks to come are really going to show whether there's a, uh, a you know, a trend or a spike uh, based on, you know, um, uh, different reopenings and such. Thank you, Chief Moody. Um, Ms. Kupka, do you have any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I do. Um, first, I just want to thank you and your staff and Sheriff Giles and his staff for everything you all are doing to keep us safe all the time. Um, could I trouble you, please, to go back to the slide that has the dashboard on it, please? The GIS. Uh, well, yes, that one. So, for 519 King George employees, six, seven, is that accurate as of today? Um, and then 32 on telework. So that's employees are ho who are home on telework. And then the sick category, the seven is separate. They're, they're on sick leave. Am I reading that right, Dr. Young? Yes, Madam Chair. We have five people that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, they're, they're none of, none of uh, COVID related. Um, we still track people that are on sick leave, you know, for various reasons, something can be illness or injury. So uh, we make sure that we track the numbers and we flag um, numbers that may be COVID related or someone that will have on quarantine. Um, so that is accurate. And yes, um, we do have 32 personnel that are currently teleworking. Um, that number fluctuates daily because sometimes we have individuals that are teleworking on one day, but they need to come to office, for example, like payroll, they have to come to office and do payroll on the S-400. So um, we try to maximize teleworking as much as possible. Um, but at the moment, that number is about 15% of our workforce. We wish we can get it higher, but with us being so dependent on um, the AS400 system, we're kind of limited in our ability to maximize the teleworking option. Thank you for clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure we didn't have a bunch of employee cases that citizens should take a look at that and be concerned about. So thank you very much for clarifying that as we do look forward to trying to reopen 
um, as early as next Friday. Thanks very much um, again for all you've done. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you go back to the last slide um, with the graph on it? It was the last graph, the one with the curve. It was hospitalizations, that one. Okay, so obviously we have great news on the right with the hospitalizations. My question is with the number of positive test results that that is jumping up, is that, uh, could that be contributed to the way they're now tracking that? Since the standards, well, there, there apparently isn't a standard. Um, it's a moving goalpost in my opinion, but now that they're tracking antibodies, now that they're tracking the number of positive tests, not necessarily the individual, now that they're tracking probable COVID cases, is could all those new changes to the way they're tracking be what's really driving that that trend up on the left when we see the the severe cases or the hospitalizations on a downward trend? Could you elaborate on that, Chief or, or Chief Lynn? Um, uh, Super, uh, Mr. Bush, can you can you repeat that question, please? I'm sorry, I tend to ramble, Chief. So, can, can you repeat is, that, please? Can he, Can you he hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry, I tend to ramble. Um, the chart on the right shows that the number of hospitalizations has been on a dramatic decrease looking at the curve, whereas the chart on the left shows a trend going upward that the number of positives has actually gone up and continues to go up. My question is, can that be attributed to the standard or the method of how they are now tracking it that they're doing the antibody test, they're doing you know probable cases, they're now tracking the number of tests, not necessarily the individual. Could that new standard that they're, they're putting in there and then going back and capturing past data that meets those criteria that weren't captured earlier, could that influx of new numbers be what's pushing this number up? That's the question. I, I can answer that, sir, if you, if you would like. Um, that, bottom line, yes. Um, you're asking, can the changes in the standards for testing? I'm sorry, I can't take somebody's microphone as well. You're asking if the changes in the methods of standards uh, for testing or for positive cases to lead to the escalation, um, for example, now including antibody testing or, um, like I said, um, looking at past cases that didn't meet the um, new uh, qualifications, I mean, didn't meet qualifications in the beginning, but now they meet those qualifications and they decided to add those on, which I'm not sure if that's what they're doing or not, I don't know. Um, but yes, obviously, if they increase the bandwidth of what they will uh, detail as a positive case, it's going to lead to an escalation in, in numbers. Um, that's why the governor's uh, Ford Virginia plan and the Ralph Rappahannock Area Health District decided that they were going to utilize the number of new hospitalizations as the standard to drive um, phase one big parts of phase two mixed marks because it's quite binary. Do we have people in the hospital or do we not? Um, and that really can't change. You can't redefine if someone's in a hospital bed for uh, COVID-19 or not. And so um, I agree that, you know, there is a little fogginess towards the way that they're uh, um, calculating these positive tests, but um, I take confidence in um, the new hospitalization standard determination um, going forward, whether, you know, a state response and a local response or kind. Thank you. So, Chief, thank you all for putting together, especially that slide number two on there, and uh, for updating that dashboard, which now shows those active cases. That's very helpful. Um, I really appreciate that. With that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bush, for your questions. Mr. Granger. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions. I'd just like to uh, say thank you to uh, Chief Moody and the Fire and EMS staff, as well as uh, Sheriff Giles and the uh, Sheriff's Department uh, for continuing to serve the citizens of our county and helping to keep us safe. 
Thank you, Mr. Granger. Mr. Stonehill. Yes, I don't really have any questions, but I do wanted to say thanks, Chief. Um, yeah, those two graphs were, were very helpful. And finally, we have the information that I know all of us, plus Mr. Bush, have always been chomping at the bit to try to get was how many people have recovered from this as opposed to our active cases. So that was, uh, that was great to see. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, you know, thank you for you and your staff and to say, thanks for and uh, have a good um ems week uh also wanted to remind everybody that last week was police week and that friday was um uh put our law enforcement memorial day and i just wanted to say thank you sheriff giles your whole staff and all the other 900 sworn police officers in the country that's all i have Thank you, Mr. Stonehill. Thank you once again for a wonderful EOC report. And I'm glad to see those new numbers and the new graphs. Dr. Stern said it would, those numbers would be available for your use and, and I'm glad to see it. And thank you, Dr. Stern for having your staff provide that. And so our EOC can keep the public informed. And I also want to give my own shout out to our Sheriff's Department and our emergency first responders. Thank you. And thank you for everyone else that works in urgent care at the hospital that is a King George resident. Thank you. Um, with that being said, Dr. Young. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, and I do want to reemphasize the uh, happy EMS week, um, Chief Moody. Um, Chief Moody, Chief Lynn, Sheriff Giles, and Chief Simmons has um, been working with me. We've been working shoulder to shoulder on a daily basis doing um, the emergency management response for King George County. And I have to say that I work with three of the um, best professionals in the business. Um, I'd be remiss not to um, let the board know that they played an instrumental role in um, the development of the reopening plan. Um, and then we was able to take, you know, our preliminary draft to our directors to gain buy-in and input. Um, so, because of the efforts of um, those professionals on in our emergency operations center, um, we do have that employee buy-in, and I'm confident that we'll be able to bring our employees in to what is promised to be a safe working environment, and we'll be able to protect our employees while at the same time getting back to the business of servicing our citizens. So, thank you all for all the hard work. And Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you so much, everyone, and, and Dr. Young especially. Do I I have a motion for adjournment? I uh, move to adjourn until June second at six thirty in the boardroom. Second. Present. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, uh, aye. Any nay? Chair votes aye. One thing before we close out: this meeting is hereby adjourned to the next regularly regularly scheduled meeting on June second, twenty twenty, at six thirty p.m. That meeting will be held by electronic means and remote participation only, and may be closed to the public, being physically present. All citizens are encouraged to participate in advance or during the meeting by electronic means, as provided by the county. Thank you everyone once again for joining us on the GoToMeeting app or online or by phone. If you'd like to see this broadcast again, it'll be on the King George County content YouTube channel. Thank you everyone very much everyone in King George. Be safe. Good night.